Colorado is still the home to indigenous people from across Turtle Island. Our intersecting communities are comprised of those native to this land, indigenous people from other territories, as well as settlers who have come here by choice, force, or otherwise as a result of settler colonialism and imperialism. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission 94 Calls to Action reaffirms that the treaties um, with indigenous peoples must be lawfully honored. We are all treaty people and are responsible for honoring and upholding those agreements. We are grateful for the opportunity to work on this territory and to share space with all of you. Um, so I'll now just give you a little overview about the sexual representation collection so that we kind of orient ourselves to um, the sort of breadth and depth of the collection we're dealing with. Then I'll introduce um, the panelists um, and give some necessary thank yous in addition to just the SCNS, Desiree and Lynn thank yous, which are our biggest thank yous. Um, the Sexual Representation Collection is Canada's largest archival collection of pornography. The collection contains roughly 5,000 VHS video cassettes and DVDs, 1,500 eight millimeter and 16 millimeter films, 1,000 magazines, hundreds of photographs and negatives, 500 pulp novels, hundreds of 35 millimeter slides, hundreds of eight millimeter cassette tapes, 30 petabytes of digital artifacts, and 300 linear feet of personal papers, legal documents, reports, art, kink objects, and unique ephemera dating from, as of yesterday, 1907 to the present. With an emphasis on feminist, queer, and kink pornography, the SRC includes important collections of Mexican, South Asian, and East Asian pornography, pre-war hardcore films, coin-op peep show films, stag films, beefcake photographs, and artifacts related to the history of sex work, sex education, and obscenity. Um, so our panelists uh, for this discussion, and this is just a sort of informal discussion slash workshop, um, are Kate McKinney, who is an assistant professor of um, communications at Simon Fraser University. Is that right? I know it was mediated sexualities, but I want to make sure I've also got, that's right, right, Kate? That's right, yeah, communication studies. Um, and this is Kate's book, latest book that is hot off the press from Duke University Press, Information Activism, A Queer History of Lesbian Media Technologies. I have already assigned it in two classes. It is, I know, circulating widely among a lot of my colleagues. Um, so if you haven't read it, I strongly encourage you to do so. Um, we're also joined by Maggie McDonald, who is a PhD student in the Faculty of Information um, at the University of Toronto, focusing on digital um, uh, politics and pornography, and Farron Evans, who's an MI student um, in the Faculty of Information with a background in media archaeology, media archives, and porn. Um, so it says I'm supposed to go to another slide. These are our thank yous. Um, we're actually really, really lucky that at the University of Toronto, we have so much support. Occasionally, we do run into um, some challenges uh, administratively, but um, with support like this, it's pre we pretty much um, get the kind of infrastructure, at least in at U of T, that we need to keep up this work, including administrative support. So the center, the, the, the collection is administered by the Mark Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies, which is the sort of LGBT studies department at U of T. And they fund um, work study students, space, all kinds of stuff for us. And obviously are, um, uh, our major advocates for the collection, it's thanks to that center that the collection has sort of been revived in the last several years. University of Toronto Libraries, I mean, basically, it's just a queer world of perverts who loves what we do and has no problem supporting it. And we're very lucky, especially to the digital preservation um, section of that collection, of that library system that helps us preserve our digital um, collections for um, in media formats that will last more than 50 years. The Knowledge Media Design Institute, which is, which is an institute devoted to studies in the value of design and ethics of design. Um, they actually fund a lot of our technology and um, there's talk that they will um, 
Uh, so that includes everything you're going to see, all the technology you're going to see today that Maggie's going to demo for us a little later. Um, but there's talk that they'll even um, chip in for a 4K scanner, so we can digitize some of those, um, some of that film that we have, which is right now we, we don't have the ability to digitize that. Um, archive counter archive Janine Marchessault's amazing project at York University. I mean, I can't tell you the support Janine and her project has have given us. Uh, mostly financial, but they pay for RAs. They they pay to have collections shipped here. Um, at Cinema Studies Institute, same thing. They're always supportive. They help us put on events, and they um, even fund some of the shipping costs for some of these collections. And of course, SHRC, um, the Society for the Social uh, Social What is it? Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Sorry, I'm still. I, I feel still. I still feel new to Canada, even though I've been here eight eight years. Um, so yeah, I'm surprised. We get federal money, federal government money to do this work. And so I'm really grateful to them for that. Um, I also just want to plug an upcoming event that the um, Adult Film History Group and the Mark Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies are putting on together. Um, it is Sex in the Archives with Arian Cruz and um, Huang Tan Nguyen, um, which is taking place February 22nd. Um, if you go to the center's website, you'll be able to get the, um, uh, the registration link on um, Eventbrite. And uh, so I encourage you to come see that. You can see that they're gonna give some fantastic talks next month. Um, okay, so before I launch right into some of the things that inspired the work we're doing, I'll just start by saying that the SRC is basically engaged in a whole bunch of activities. Obviously, as you know, we're putting on events, uh, but we also process new um, collections. Um, some of them are collections that we get from studios directly, like kink.com. Um, they, they constitute a huge part of the digital collection. Um, some of it uh, are collections that we get from film historians, like Tom Waugh. We're very grateful that Tom will be letting us preserve um, that we've earned the right, frankly, to preserve um, Tom's wonderful collection. Um, and um, some of it's from random people. We, we, I mean, we do talk to them before they send us just anything that they have, but, um, you know, occasionally we, there are folks who have really important things out there that are rare items, and we're more than happy to um, um, figure out how to get them here in Toronto and start preserving them and digitizing them. Obviously, we have the, these digitization efforts, um, mostly textual and VHS. Um, we've um, hooked up with the library system to preserve our digital collections on, um, uh, on magnetic tape so that it will last for, at this point, about 100 years. Um, it will be able to be accessible in a different media format. You know, I figure if I can preserve something in a digital format for 100 years, it's someone else's problem at that point. Um, uh, well, it's at least the library's problem. Um, you know, the pandemic has sort of halted our cataloging efforts, but we've been told we'll be able to be in the library's catalog, um, including right down to individual VHS tapes at some point. Um, we also are able to preserve our stuff off site at a, a facility called Downsview, which is just an off site storage facility that's environmentally and purpose built for preserving media. Um, and um, yeah, that kind of takes me to the next thing, which is that one day I hope that some of this digital material will find itself on archive.org. And one of the sort of inspirations for that is this article from Peter Alalunas and Dan Erdman um, in Cinema Journal. Some of you may have read it already. And I'll just sort of summarize a little bit of what it says and um, what it means for this, um, for this event today. As many of you will know, historians of adult film history face a number of challenges in traditional libraries and archives, including a lack of accessibility perplexing metadata and filing protocols, the thin paper trail the adult industry leaves behind, conservative institutional politics, um, the low priority archivists sometimes attached to pornography, and financial barriers to research. Um, our collection hopes to address some of these challenges in part by making an important archive of adult film history 
digitally available to scholars, non-academic uh, historians, fans, and industry members for free um, worldwide. This is a critical endeavor when traditional libraries and archives often set aside material relating to adult film history and out of the way shelves, uncatalogued, ignored, and forgotten. Moreover, the adult film industry did not create conventional paper trails, nor do they necessarily embrace their own long-term legacies. Um, in almost all cases, the bits and pieces that they do leave behind have not been preserved or archived with conventional methods. The result for historians and the broader public has been a methodologically and complicated landscape defined by um, these sort of sets of challenges. Yet our efforts, um, these digitization efforts and preservation efforts, um, raise a number of questions about the limit limitations of digitization. It's not a magic bullet solution to space accessibility and preservation challenges. And it raises all kinds of other questions about archival gaps, representation, consent in the archive, um, and consent within the digitization efforts of archives, theories of evidence, media archaeology, the role of errata historiography for telling media histories, copyright, and other legal challenges in trying to make these materials available, especially during a pandemic, um, and the political economy of archival and digital labor provenance, authenticity, relevance, standards of archival description, historical context, and metadata that makes these um, systems uh, retrieve materials effectively, um, as well as store them long term. Um, we're not the first collection, uh, porn, even sort of porn specific collection that's trying to do some of these digitization efforts. Some of you might have heard of the archives, Canada's LGBTQ archives. If not, please uh, take a look at their website. Um, Kate actually um, did some work with them to digitize some of their porn archives. I know um, that I was fortunate enough to see Kate um, in action digitizing fisting, gay male fisting videos. And I brought my class one day and we had a long conversation about fisting and digitiz digitization and um, the relationship between the two. Um, these are some of the images from an, from an installation Kate did at the archives um, that was about sort of, um, you know, the, the sort of media archaeology and digitization. And it was, you could bring your own tapes and digitize them there, bring your own porn and digitize them in the archive. And uh, my favorite part of the installation was um, this one, uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see this sort of old 1980s chair set up so that you could, um, as well as this lovely fern, um, so that you could recreate the sort of erotic experience of masturbating to VHS in the archive. What I loved about this was that it was an enactment in many ways of a kind of media archeology span meets erotic historiographic like not just installation art, but like praxis, right? And um, so I don't know, I, although I don't know if anybody actually did participate in trying to recreate the sort of historical evidence of pleasure as a way of telling us something about, um, uh, about the past, um, but um, you know, in, in, which, in which pleasure serves as evidence for a sort of um, knowing of, of uh, a, a sort of historical way of knowing but um, I, I really hope somebody did. And I don't, I don't know if Kate, if you wanna chime in here and say anything about this installation, which you did with your partner, um, Hazel Meyer. Um, and, uh, or should I just, should we come back to this later? I, I have lots of questions about errata historiography in the archive, but um, you know, I'll, I'll pause to hear if you have anything to say. Uh, I, I mean, you, you covered it in a lovely way. I'll add is, the uh, archives digitization of VHS more broadly started with this show. So I think it's interesting to think about how both art and also porn can be right. um, an entry to kind of mediated transitions and in institutions. Great, thanks Kate, awesome. Um, so at this point, um, for those of you who haven't had the lovely pleasure and tedious pleasure of digitizing um, some porn, uh, Maggie's going to just walk us through briefly what the steps are for digitizing VHS. And um, 
Uh, I think I'll stop sharing my screen so that you know people can make you bigger on their screens, Maggie. Is that all right? You're on mute. Oh, there. Yeah, that sounds good. I've got no fern, but I will <laughs> set the stage. I'll show you a quick 360 of the room so you have an idea of what we're working with here. So this is one of two on-site storage locations for the archive. As uh, Patrick mentioned, the vast majority of holdings are stored off-site. Uh, the room that we are in, while it is a, a nice series of acid-free filed folder uh, boxes, each of these contains uh, I'd say approximately 50 VHS tapes. Uh, this is the Pronger collection. They are largely uh, gay porn from the 80s and 90s. So uh, I'm going to take you through the actual process with a real tape. I'm just trying to make sure I give you a good angle. Uh, for starters, this is what I see when I open a box. And each box has a lovingly compiled finding aid that was put together back in 2017, before my time, uh, that lists the accession number, uh, a finding aid that lists them by title, and they're almost always accurate. Uh, and as myself and the other RA digitizing the archive Farron go through in our shifts, we just make note in the margins uh, who has digitized what VHS. Now, these VHSs, some of them are only an hour and a half long. Some of them are six hour compilations. And frankly, we have no way of knowing when we start out. So it does lead to some interesting shifts uh, with extremely long compilations of different titles. And they're also often uh, arranged in ways that are very surprising. Sometimes it is purely hardcore pornography. We uh, hit a clip a few months ago that was almost entirely uh, wrestling, like largely non-sexual uh, or at least non-penetrative non or explicitly sexual in nature, amateur wrestling videos that every once in a while was interspersed with a hardcore porno. Uh, today, I'm taking you through a compilation VHS. Uh, of the following titles, He Devils, Tiger Tales, Intense Heat, Sailor in Sydney, Sean King, and Island Fever. This is our setup. I see people are in the chat. I might actually ask uh, Farron or Patrick to respond to the chat questions. It's hard for me to monitor at the same time. Thanks so much. It's mostly just me saying that I like Sailor in Sydney. Ah. <laughs> So we're using a software called Media Express. And luckily for me, it's very intuitive to use. Uh, we've just been going according to the finding aid uh, accession numbers in chronological order. So uh, to date, I mean, this round of digitization started, I want to say in mm, September, early September, if memory serves. Uh, we've digitized this is the 86th title in the collection. And of course, uh, each of those accession numbers, it's very rare to have only a single porn on a VHS. It's often five, six porns uh, per VHS. So we're probably somewhere in the, between the two and 300 uh, individual videos range at this point. So Media Express has a capture function. I'm so sorry because I know it's very small. Let's see if I can get a better angle on this for you. Media Express has a capture function. Here we go. Uh, we're in. We're using the same uh, metadata as we have in the finding aids on the Media Express software. So under log and capture, very simply include the number and it actually autofills as well, which I love. Uh, so this particular collection is 2017-001086. And the capture process begins and it is as simple as ensuring that it is uh, not midway through the tape, that it is rewound appropriately and popping it in.
One thing that I unfortunately cannot do is share the audio with everybody. I would love to. Uh, our audio is currently synced in through headphones. Um, one of the most delightful parts of this RA task is the, uh, because it is of course the 80s and 90s VHS, uh, the soundtracks. Many of them clearly bespoke for the videos in question. Lots of fun. Uh, because this particular VHS listed six titles, I would not be surprised to see it be a full six hour one. And this is where one of the interesting um, elements of digitization comes in that's a lot less like sexy or perverted or glamorous. A lot of it is waiting. Uh, a good portion of the actual labor involved in the digitization process is passively monitoring to make sure that there's no sudden uh, like video glitching, to make sure that there is no sudden audio spike grating. I don't even necessarily keep the headphones on most of the time. You can actually sort of hear that the volume is steady just sitting next to the screen waiting without headphones on. Uh, and when it comes to the storage of the data, Yes, we haven't had any breakage. Uh, Kate, time-based corrector. I have to admit that as a non-traditionally uh, trained archivist, I don't want to give you an incorrect answer. Maybe Patrick knows a little bit more about this. Yes, we are. Um, so we're using a black magic um, setup with a time-based corrector on the, I don't know if you can show them the front of the panel of the, It'll be a little clumsy, but I can do it. Yeah, sorry. So some of the controls are right down here. All of this is like, so one of the things, Kate, that was pretty amazing, and then the, the black magic's behind you. It's the white box behind you. Oh, sorry, everyone. I hope none of you are getting seasick. Yeah. Um, and yeah, all of, except for the black magic white box, um, the rest of this is all equipment that was used in other projects. So none of it was like equipment. We, we were really sort of concerned about electronic waste in a project like this. And KMDI, what they do is um, repurpose technologies from other projects at the university um, to give, so it's all sort of like hand-me-down kinds of stuff, um, but it works perfectly well for our purposes. Sometimes it just needs a bit of an upgrade. Um, and so it's, all of our stuff is sort of like a, a kind of, um, yeah, pastiche of other technologies. And sometimes it breaks and then KMDI get, finds us a new one, so. Yeah, one of, the, one of the challenges we faced in this round of digitizing has been storage. Uh, we're currently using an external hard drive. Uh, I believe this one's three terabytes pro rage. Uh, and we're actually writing the files directly onto the drive. Uh, we're waiting for the university, well, the college administration to give us server space to have a more secure long-term solution. Um, yeah. Because we have been slipping into using multiple drives. This is actually the second drive that we've cycled through. The smaller ones filled up so quickly because many of these files are massive. Uh, like we're looking at 50 gig files. Oh no, bigger than that. So yeah. they start at 200 gigs and they go up to 400. Mm -hmm. So each one of the disks in that external drive is eight terabytes. We can hold 16 terabytes and, until I buy more. But what I basically do is just meet the um, digital preservation archivist, uh, digital preservation librarian in a parking lot and hand off the like physical drives to him, um, you know, and then he takes them back to his office since we can't meet on campus during the pandemic. And he um, downloads them um, onto the university servers and then they write them to magnetic tape. So I basically hand off about 16 terabytes at a time. Um, and then when he hands them back to us, we spend a day deleting. So there's like a delete day and then we can start record, we can start, um, uh, 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 digitizing more VHS after that. I mean, we can we can always buy more external hard drives, but because the you're going to ask why are you doing this on external hard drives? That's so dangerous, and somebody could just like pick that thing up and walk out of the archive with it, uh, or you could break it on your way on. You know, it could drop in the in the snow in in the middle of the um, parking lot. And the reason why we have to do it on external hard drives and physically hand it over is because 
um, 200 gigs and especially 400 gigs per file exceeds the amount of, um, it exceeds the file size that the university will allow for us to upload things to cloud services or download or upload to university servers directly. So I think Microsoft's OneDrive limits people at this university anyway to 100 gigabytes. And if anything's bigger than 100 gigabytes, it's just never gonna happen. You're never gonna be able to load it to OneDrive or to SharePoint or, I mean, this university basically contracted with Microsoft for all of these things. And so that one of the sort of technical limitations of doing this work is that file sizes for moving images are so big that it makes it hard to actually transfer those files. And so really it's a combination of digital and physical transfer that allows this work to happen. Um, if they were smaller files like text-based files, we would just have an endless amount of space on a OneDrive to, uh, and an endless amount of um, um, downloading and uploading um, speed to be able to do all of that. Um, and unless we start cutting these files down um, and making them smaller, sorry, I should remove the spotlight on you, Maggie, apologies. Um, unless, we, um, uh, unless we make this files smaller, we're not going to be able to sort of transfer them digitally like you would um, on a Dropbox or something. Um, and, and the only way you could do that is to make literally editorial choices um, about each of these videos. And that's not something we want to do. And it did take some time to explain to, um, to explain to sort of IT staff at the university that the digital file is an artifact itself. Um, and I had to sort of try to find analogies, like you wouldn't ask someone to cut up, you know, ancient scrolls in order to um, make them small enough so that the, fi so that the files could transfer. Um, and it took them a while to understand that the digital file was not just mere, uh, that, that all data isn't the same and that sort of data have different dynamics and different qualities and that the artifact of, that the artifact of this data, that this data was an artifact and that the quality of that artifact was, its, was partly its size. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of, there's a lot of like technical I mean, at the moment, we don't have any major administrative hurdles, but we just have a lot of um, technical hurdles. One of the things that's really challenging is being able to share these files, stream these files globally. Even if we have the copyright permissions to do that, there's sort of technical limitations that, uh, that don't yet enable us to share that way. And libraries, which are usually in the business of sharing, um, most of their systems aren't built for moving images. They're much better at sharing text-based files. So oftentimes where professors store, the, um, store their articles in university online repositories, those are built for text-based artifacts and not moving image artifacts. And then archives have a kind of different vibe to them, which is they're not necessarily there to make things widely available the way archives are. And so they may not have any platforms that actually share things. So um, some of that is dealing with the different cultures um, of the institutions. And some of that's also just dealing with the different sort of technical limitations that universities put on things. Um, anything else you wanna um, say, uh, Maggie? Uh, the whole, the very, uh, tedious nature is one of the things that I would highlight because so much of it also has to do with the location that we're saving the files to. Uh, it takes a long time just practically uh, for research assistants to transfer files from one location to another. And I'm talking like hours uh, for what normally when you think of a text-based file would take a very short period of time, a six hour VHS copy. Uh, even if at the end of the night, you realize you've saved it to a local drive instead of uh, our RAID drive, it literally will extend a shift by two hours just to move it onto the RAID drive. So it's not ideal, it's, we're definitely making it work. I actually have never asked Patrick this question as to whether you think it would be different if we had undertaken this not during COVID when the administration is constantly gummed up with other concerns or is this the standard? Um, yeah, no, we would still face all of these problems, but what's nice about this moment is that people are starting to think about what long-term issues we're going to have digitally. And what's great about that is that I'm able to insert our little porn project into all kinds of conversations. So I just wrote a white paper 
basically outlining for the government what the di what kinds of digital infrastructures uh, gaps uh, exist in Canada around digital humanities research. And while porn was not the, the main example I went with, certainly digitizing film was one of the primary examples for the kinds of infrastructural gaps that exist. I mean, moving di the digitization of moving images just is not a priority for a lot of institutions. It's like kind of an afterthought. They're concerned with things like satellite data among environmental scientists, or they're concerned with right, new data clustering models coming out of computer science. Um, and even within digital humanities, they mostly imagine, and, and digital humanities gets way more exciting than this, but they mostly imagine text-based projects. So trying to get institutions to think about um, technical infrastructures that can accommodate these kinds of artifacts is one of the challenges we face. But because everybody's thinking long-term right now about digital policies and protocols going forward and what infrastructures are gonna be and platforms are gonna be necessary going forward, I'm basically at all of those meetings talking about what it's like to digitize porn. Um, yeah, and every now and then you get some weird looks, but mostly people, you know, people are um, interested to see, to hear what our challenges have been, so. And if any of this, by the way, if you need us to slow down any of this conversation or break down what is an external hard drive, I don't know where the like audience um, level is at, like where the, where the sort of knowledge level is at digitally or in terms of like VHS. So um, we're more than happy to go into more detail about any of this. And as you can see, there's a lot of questions, sort of um, pragmatic questions being asked and answered in the chat. And we can get to some of those when we have like a panel and audience discussion. Um, should we move into that now or do you, is there anything else, Maggie? You're good? That really covers the majority of the work. Uh, the actual I would say, I would, I'd like to add that um, there is yeah. a cooperative element between uh, Maggie and me in that I don't I don't want to speak for Maggie but I think when we started I had a sense that okay I'll go in for my shifts I'll do x number of tapes and that will be my shift and it took us it took us a while to figure out timing especially moving on to these six, seven more hour tapes that are that are taped on SLP, EP, um, as most of us, or a lot of us know, uh, a lot of these home dub tapes can max out at eight hours. So, you know, we went into these contracts with the expectation that we're doing five hour shifts. Um, so sometimes we do five hour shifts, sometimes we do eight, sometimes in between. But I think, um, We've reached sort of an understanding now of um, we have to get a feel for these four title, five title tapes of when a title is about to end within the compilations so that we can stop it and create an, um, an A file or a B, in a B file within that tape and sort of communicate that to each other. So a lot of it is, uh, you know, I think, I think some people think, and I thought at one point that, you know, VHS digitization digitizing is a lot of hurry up and wait. And in many senses that is true, but you know, beyond the AV quality checks and making sure that the, you know, that the sound isn't maxing out and buzzing. And you also, you know, there are instances where you have to pay attention so that uh, when you don't know what's on this magnetic media title, um, you sort of have to just be flexible so that when you reach a place that seems like a stopping point, even, you know, it might not be perfect, but you got to stop it where, where it stops. And, and, you know, there's, there's sort of some ambiguity there that I think anyone who gets into a large uh, magnetic media digitizing project should sort of take into mind. Definitely. I definitely agree with that. Uh, and Farron and I, because we are the only two RAs working on this digitization project at this stage, we just use a couple of different channels to be in communication with each other. If it's 8 p.m. and I have to get out of the archive, uh, I will send him a message with a note as, as to what uh, VHS I had to pause on and where to segment it into a part B and vice versa. Uh, we're just very reflexive in the length of our shifts that sometimes have to rapidly adapt to the material that we are digitizing. It's a really good point. 
Thanks. Um, Kate, do you want to talk at all about your experience? I mean, some of the questions I was going to ask to guide the panel discussion were, I was going to start with just sort of like functional questions about the tediousness of the labor. You've heard us talk a little bit about that, how it's a minute by minute process. A three hour tape takes three hours to digitize. Um, and we've talked a little, did we talk at all about the cost of the equipment in the chat? Um, I don't know, Kate, do you remember how much the archives paid since all of our stuff has been hand-me-down? We kind of didn't pay for any of it. <laughs> yeah, um, so you, the things you need are a VCR, uh, a shuttle that can, I'm typing this well, that's why I'm saying it silly, that converts analog to VHS. And if your VCR isn't fancy, you need what's called a time-based corrector. Fancy VCRs, this is built in, but by fancy VCR, I mean a VCR that you have to buy on eBay for $600 and have like reconditioned. That's the kind of VCR that, that these folks are working with at U of T. So it's a, it's a bit uh, spendy. The shuttle is in Canada is about 300. So in the US it's probably like 200. And the time-based yeah. corrector is in, also in Canada, about 300, 200. Uh, and, and then the storage space, and anyone can do this at, at their home provided you can, um, find old equipment, like even I've used thrift store VCRs to do this. Um, if you just clean them, it's very easy to clean clean a VCR yourself. So it's like, it's actually a very accessible thing that you can do in, in quite a DIY way with equipment that's less um, less fancy than what a university um, is is able to, to scrounge up. Um, and I can, I still have notes about, oh, so the time-based corrector, Daniel just asked, it's really cool what this does. Uh, so old VHS tape, has um, frames that are often damaged, like any VHS tape that's 10 years or older is gonna have frames that are a little bit damaged. And most consumer grade VCRs, when they get to a frame that has any kind of damage, they skip it because they're not fancy enough to, to process and show the frame. Um, but the audio track keeps going at the same frame, frame rate. So if you were to digitize a tape without a time-based corrector, the audio and the video would gradually go more and more out of sync as you move through the, the video because frames are dropping, but the audio persists at the same time range. Um, and so the time-based corrector fills in those damaged frames with the frames that are adjacent to them to create the perception of a stable vis visual signal even when the tape is a bit rough. And I learned that through trial and error. Um, I learned that through starting to digitize tapes and having them be out of sync and then figuring out that I needed this thing. And as a you know, humanities scholar who's interested in the theory of these kinds of things, I thought it was really cool that we were losing time through the, the damage that had been done to these tapes, like through the passing of time. It was obviously a, a problem that we needed to solve to get good files, but it was also kind of a, a neat thing to think about. Well, I mean, that's interesting. That you so there's two points I want to raise, Kate, just on um, to, to, to build on yours. One is uh, manufacturers have stopped making VHS players. And so one of the reasons they're pricey is simply that there's folks like us trying to do this work and there's not enough VHS players to go around. Um, but the other, um, the other thing I was going to say is, you know, it, what's interesting about VHS is we're, it's it's thought that we need to be really careful with it. And I agree, although it's this like, it was built to be this like home media product that was really durable, right? And I've heard some media archivists refer to the process of playing VHS as lubricating it, um, as lubricating the tape, which I think makes, as, as, make, especially makes sense in the context of a porn archive. But the, 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 that actually does something to help, um, help preserve it is if it gets played every now and then. I know that there are other forms of media where that's the case, where like the idea of the white gloves is actually dangerous to the, to the preservation and that you should really, you know, touch things sometimes or play things or look at things um, sometimes. I don't, do you wanna, do you have any thoughts on the lubrication of VHS? It's, it's like a, a best practice in archives is to every couple of years play and rewind a tape, which is what lubricates the tapes so that doesn't get too brittle and, and snap. 
Um, and when I started volunteering at the archives, I'd spent a lot of time like playing and rewinding tapes for that purpose before we were digitizing them and then creating better metadata about what was on the tapes. Because a lot of times archives, including probably the, the sexual representation collection, you have these huge collections and you're not sure what's on all of them. Um, and so uh, it becomes this kind of very slow and plotting process of lubrication that is like for porn scholars, to, I think to re real low hanging fruit, uh, cause it's like such a lovely metaphor pushed somewhere else about media. I'm curious about that. Is is it is there an advantage to watching it in real time, i.e. the pace we watch with the digitization process, or is it just as helpful to fast forward rewind? As long as you can watch it on fast forward and then rewind, it'll do the same thing for lubrication. So I've, I've watched a lot of 80s gay porn on fast forward. Yeah, I mean, what's crazy is having to teach undergrads how to fast forward or rewind, and then like to see the reaction when they see how much time it takes. You know, like where they're like, you've got, you've got to be kidding me. Why is this going so slowly? Can't, why can't I just skip to the, anyway, I don't know. I don't want to make it seem like undergrads don't know VHS, but some of them don't. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, we're getting ready to sort of open it up to an audience conversation now. And I don't, I, I don't know if we want to move into questions about historiography yet, or if people still want us to talk sort of just practically about how all of this works. One of the reasons why I want to talk about how it works and sort of show the stuff is not to sort of fetishize the process or the technology, but um, in part to show just how tedious the labor is and um, how um, much time it takes to sort of do all of this and how much troubleshooting it requires. And there are definitely days where you thought you were, where you were digitizing something and all of a sudden it stopped or you ran out of space and you thought you had enough space and you just wasted the, la the, like, the last two hours. And so there's a kind of frustration in, involved in all of this too. And so you just want, I mean, one of the things I wanted to do is sort of emphasize the sort of materiality of the, of the work and the labor involved. Um, but are, are just, do any folks listening have questions about how this works um, that we didn't answer or, any, any issues you want to bring up along those lines? Okay, great. Well, why don't you think about it? And while you do, I will, uh, I just, the other thing I didn't want to do was sort of give the fa this false impression that digitization somehow solves many of the problems of doing history or that somehow by making this um, collection available digitally, um, we're somehow revolutionizing the way this research gets done. Um, oh, sorry, Katrina had a question. So I'll just leave this other, we'll go to Katrina's question, but um, one of the things I wanted us to talk about are what are the limits of digitization? What are the, what are the things that it forecloses um, as well as the things that it allows? And um, how might it change um, sort of our approach to experiencing this media? And um, how might it, it change then how, um, what, how this media functions as evidence? Um, I had a question about rad description being years away. Is this because you are waiting, whoa, sorry. You're waiting to process everything as based on experience, the software is embedded in the metadata. Um, yeah, so part of it, part of this is just um, doing what we can now. Um, there, there are, there is metadata that is embedded in the media, and then there's metadata that you'll add later. And the stuff that's embedded has to do with runtimes, obviously. Um, it has to do with the date, right, when things are digitized. Um, but the metadata that we'll add later, that would be, um, that would be, uh, especially relevant for certain kinds of archival finding. Um, that's something that we're just, I mean, we have finding aids for the collection and some of those are pretty detailed, but um, when we try to make our digital collections available as a sort of finding aid, um, I think that's so many years away now that I'm not, I'm not interested yet in the kinds of metadata we'll wanna come up with. 
Um, but I definitely appreciate that question. I mean, at the moment, it's a kind of just do what we can to make this um, material available. One of the reasons we started with this collection in particular is because there have been a few film scholars who come to us saying, oh, you're the only place I know that has this 1980s porn film from Montreal that features like a Madonna video in the background. And I really need that for a talk I'm doing. And can you please digitize it for me? I wanna, I wanna show that in a talk I'm giving, you know, later this year. And, and so because we know that some of the uh, 80s uh, gay porn that we have isn't widely available, we're trying to get some of that digitized um, partly based on um, what, what people have already asked for. Um, and then we've also, I mean, earlier prior to this project, we were digitizing the Canadian Coalition Against Customs Censorship, which was a, an activist group that was fighting against the Customs Enforcement Agency in Canada, um, which had regulated, um, right, the, which had regulated transferring sexual objects across the border, including like Audre Lorde's books, as well as gay porn and magazines. Um, and so um, that had been this like highly sought after collect, their papers had been highly sought after by a number of scholars. And so we wanted to try and make that stuff available. So our priority is to just, it's kind of this fast and dirty, um, good enough approach to um, getting things to people who need them. Um, and it's not, we're not necessarily trying to create the most beautiful metadata for a future, you know, um, um, for a future like internet database or something. Um, do the films come with, so feel free to ask, to ask the questions because I hate to like read, I hate to like have to read all your questions and like assume your voice throughout this. Um, but let's see, I kind of lost my place. So we're like a ways back now. Um, can I ask like per perm jit? Is that right, mom? If you can just ask us some of your questions. Cause I know you have a bunch and I don't want to have to, I don't want to go through all of them, but let's see. Oh, I can barely hear you. Maybe that's why. Um... Okay, yeah. They maybe... asked if you have the copyright ownership. Yeah, copyright's a great question. So um, some of these are um, fair use because, um, uh, I mean, that's actually such a huge answer. First, if we're dealing with like 1980s gay porn, some of the studios didn't survive the AIDS pandemic. Others went defunct for any number of reasons. Some of them were bought by other studios. So sometimes you're in luck and like Catalina owns the copyright. And by in luck, I mean, literally you found who owns it and you can work with them. But if you can't find who owns it, um, at least in Canada, if you've made a good faith effort to find who owns it and you can't, um, then, then um, you do, you can um, show it publicly. Um, so, it and when it comes to questions of copyright, it depends on what you're sort of doing with the material. Is this being used as part of like a, um, an exhibition? Is it being used as part of a screening at an academic talk? Is it being used as part of like a film festival? Or are you trying to just put it up online like on archive.org? Our goal is not to create um, a, a sort of YouTube of, of or a, a sort of porn hub of old porn. Right, um, that's not our goal. Our goal is to make the stuff digitally available to scholars for their purposes. Um, so if we know that it's under copyright, we would absolutely go through the necessary permissions. And in Canada, there's a lot of leeway when it comes to education. So showing it in class or showing it at a, um, right, in an academic context, um, there's a lot more leeway. You don't have to go and get explicit permission for that. But if we were going to try and like actually pub publish something online, we would definitely make sure that we had permission to do that before we before we put anything online. I've got, can I 
ask another question? Um, yeah. Um, so um, I saw that you have the boxes of the videotapes in, they're in boxes, right? Do they come with cases as well? Because that's another object that you would have to archive. And do they come with descriptive metadata on the cases? Yeah, so I'm gonna let Maggie or Farron answer that one. Did you guys hear that question? Uh, I did, yes. Yeah. So at least uh, for the Pronger collection, uh, these are almost entirely compilations. So we don't have cases, if you're talking about metadata in terms of the original release of like studio produced pornographies, we do not have that. Uh, because these are home compilations, a lot of them come with uh, little printed out labels of the titles. Uh, however, I believe that a good chunk of those were processed by the collector, not by the person who theoretically uh, like recorded all of these onto the tapes. And some of them are wrong, which is one of the things we have to deal with as archivists. Like the one that I pulled out uh, actually had has just a penciled over correction. You can perhaps see it if I get really close to the screen. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the finding aids have the accurate titles listed uh, that were produced in 2017, and we are digitizing them according to those finding aid titles. But unfortunately, we don't have like much visual metadata in regards uh, to like a case that has promo material or previews or lists the actors or the run times. None of that is available in the material. Yeah, not at least in the Pronger collection. There are other VHS collections where we do have it and we do preserve the cases. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Sky asked, how do you think academia approaches sex media and sex work? And what are your um, opinions on it? And how might it be improved on, do you think this project has impacted the way this kind of media is approached in an academic setting? I mean, it's a big question. There's a lot of people in academia researching um, sex media and sex work. So this, right, this entire group at SCMS is devoted to studying adult film history. Um, and then there's a whole slew of um, folks in academia who are interested in a variety beyond just adult film media, a variety of sex media and sex work you know, again, sociologists, anthropologists, cinema scholars, lots, lots of folks are invested in sex worker politics. Um, and um, I, I mean, in order to, it's hard to talk monolithically about all the work everyone's doing. Um, and so I'll just say that there's a lot of variety of work out there and I would definitely um, take a look uh, at, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of some good, I mean, there was a recent, well, I don't know, does anybody want to maybe type into the chat some um, basic rep, uh, resources to begin looking at some of that work before I just start spouting off my friend's books? Um, let's see, Laura asked, what type of background research are you doing prior to digitization to determine the legality of digitizing the tapes? And they are not already available digitally elsewhere. So our goal is not one of our goals is to preserve the tapes um, so that they last longer than the current media formats that they're in. So to answer the second question, um, whether they're available digitally elsewhere is only partly a consideration. And if it's available, like if somebody uploaded it to one of the tube sites, probably illegally, um, we're not really interested in the fact that like a for-profit mega conglomerate tube site um, has it available digitally. Um, that wouldn't affect, right, what motivates this project or why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and so, yeah, the idea is to um, make a lot of these, um, make a lot of this media available digitally that's not available digitally. Um, and um, a lot of the stuff that we have, it's really hard to find some of it. Um, some of it you can definitely find, right? Um, and some of it, some of these studios still exist. You can still order some of it from the studio. Um, and for folks who want, like, especially for gay porn, a really good resource is um, nakedsword.com's, um, right, collection. You pay a, a fee just like you would to Netflix 
and you get these huge back catalogs of a ton of gay studios. Um, it's kind of like the Netflix of gay porn. Um, and all of the studios have sort of um, collaborated in on that project. Um, so it's definitely the case that some of this is, is available digitally elsewhere. It's definitely the case that some of the studios are interested in creating um, digital versions of their backlogs, but there's a lot of studios that can't do that. And there's a lot of studios that are defunct and aren't around anymore and their collections would be lost otherwise. Um, and um, so, yeah, there's a lot of motivations that go into this project. And it's not just about like digitizing stuff and putting it online. That's definitely not the goal. Um, I think it's all, just to jump in there, I think it's like the, when we're talking about commercially produced pornography, which is what we're talking about right now, right? That's, that's yeah, one thing in legal questions about copyright matter. But, you know, we can also extend some of these questions about the decision to digitize a tape to other forms of porn. Like in, in, in my work as both a community archivist uh, meeting like a totally non-expert volunteer archivist. And also as a scholar, I'm interested in like what happens to those like sort of amateur tapes that like some group of lesbians made in like 1984 um, and like it somehow ended up in an archives. And uh, what does it mean to digitize that tape? Like even if you're just digitizing it for use in the archive, the fact that it's digitized makes it much, much more accessible. It makes it much, much more likely for folks to write about it. And as scholars, that's exciting to us and as archivists and librarians, access is always like something we're trained to drive toward, but there's also questions about the kind of community origins of some of this material and like what it means to shine attention on it 40 years after it's made, um, when people might have very different uh, relationships to like the choice they made at that time to participate in the, the making of community-based porn. Yeah, and we definitely have community-based work. We're not, at the moment, we're focusing more on Pronger. Um, and so that's kind of guiding our conversation. But yeah, that's a great point, Kate. And um, this archive- I'm sure, I'm sure Desiree deals with that a lot, probably, in, in the, the research that Desiree does. Yeah, it's, I, I've had some folks who I've approached to interview who very clearly don't want to talk about it or revisit it um for sort of a variety of reasons but a couple of folks uh, sort of like i don't know how to put it um they understood themselves as creating a lot of these videos for a very particular community that in a lot of ways doesn't exist anymore and so the videos are sort of out of time and place for them in a way that i think makes some folks uncomfortable and other folks excited. Um, I've talked to a couple of the women who owned production companies that put out a couple of videos about potentially donating any of the materials they have left over and um, working with archives in order to get those tapes digitized. And they're really, really hesitant about that. Um, I think everybody told me like, oh, well, I would really have to think about it and then sort of like never spoke to me about it again. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, it's a thing for sure. I would say though um, that this again proves that porn archives and you know sort of porn studies is really at the forefront of all of the most important issues of, of access and ethics. Um, in my other contract at University of Toronto um, at Media Commons, we, we're, we're, we dealt with the acquisition from Mario Prizek, who was a big Canadian uh, producer. I think Daniel's still in here. Um, he, he knows much more about the prize that collection, but um, we had old um, photographs um, of Mario and uh, his friends on, on sort of these gay outings that were never meant to necessarily see the light of day or be published by an institution. And so there was a lot of conversation and I'm sure it's not a problem of me sort of relaying these internal talks, but like sort of conversations of what does it mean to plan a digital exhibition and then potentially consider having these materials of these people who maybe never wanted to be out, who might be alive, who might be dead. And so these, you know, this, this AV work of explicitly sexual material is not 
you know, sort of um, delineated clearly from any other AV materials that we're dealing with. And in fact, they are sort of emblematic of the ethics of archiving. So I think, you know, it, it's, you have to look at this holistically and see, um, you know, explicitly sexual materials as part of this um, larger continuum and, and this larger ecosystem of AV materials and archival ethics inherent to those materials. Thanks, Karen. Um, I mean, we've talked now a little bit about the um, possibilities that digitization create. I, I, I drew on your example, Farron, in the chat um, to talk about the, 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 yeah, we did digitize some BDSM park sex videos. Like the National Film Board um, in Canada came to us and said, we're sure you have these and um, can you please find them? Um, and sure enough, we totally had them. Um, they, they knew, I guess, through like rumor that they were in our collection and they wanted to use them for an upcoming documentary. And so it was really kind of amazing to be able to, to digitize that for them. Um, and so those are kinds of some of the examples of things that this project allows. Um, and I'm wondering if we can think about stuff that digitization forecloses, media experiences that digitization forecloses, or um, ways in which it changes how we might do history? I know that's a big question. I know that uh, my personal research is so based on tube sites, uh, which are such an immediate, uh, such an immediate return on experience. It's so about, like you're like a skipping stone through content. And I think that this particular contract, interacting with these VHS types is such an exercise in patience. Uh, and I think that there's this interesting reintroduction uh, to the patience associated with this media form for me, uh, that even in, in the digitization, uh, the digitization process where we have these massive back-to-back -back digital files, splitting them up would really take away from the original intent behind compiling them together, the way that they're compiled, even the way that they're arranged against each other is a huge part of the experience of watching each individual tape. Yeah. Thanks, Maggie. Anyone else? I mean, I think part of, part of what you're seeing with these compilation tapes are like um, records of uh, the ways that folks share pornography and like the, the, those ones with the typed labels generally um, are uh, videos that men have made uh, to share with friends or to share in their like, uh, uh, like porn sharing network that they're part of. Um, but then there's also ones that are more DIY that are also compilations where people have like copied stuff that they really, really like onto their like special spanking tape. Um, so, you, so you get this kind of sense with VHS tape because of the, the nature of it as like a dubbing based medium of a, like a different story about the way that porn is consumed and shared. And, and it's that's something that, you know, lots of scholars have written about, but confronting it when you're digitizing it, it really is palpable in this way that's quite special. Um, Kate, do you want me to show the video from Jeff's um, I feel like Jeff's video might be relevant here. Would you like me to? Yeah, so this is a clip from uh, one of the tapes a community member brought in. Um, his name's Jeff that we digitized as part of that exhibition. And it's a tape he made as a teenager. He would stay up, he's queer, and he'd stay up after his parents went to bed on Saturdays, which was when the satellite channel showed porn. Um, and he would tape it, but they, they didn't subscribe to the channel, so there's no audio, because that was how that channel was scrambled. But he also liked WWF wrestling, like, cause it's, you know, really gay, but uh, also cause he liked it as a sport. And so the tape flips between clips of WWF wrestling and hardcore eight, 90s, early 90s, late 80s gay porn. And, and then also like at one point, one of his parents tapes a public broadcasting documentary over part of the tape, uh, cause it was what was in the VCR. So I love this tape as this kind of record of um, huh. the way queer, I described it well enough, the way that queer um, 
the way that queer youth used VHS tape, right? To like access and make media. And that's something that you gain access to when you use digitization in a community archives context as an opportunity to change what the collection is or to bring new things into the collection through like the act of inviting people to like bring in your tapes, we'll digitize them. You can donate them to the archives or not. They'll leave you the file. Sorry, there was sound there for a minute. Uh, I'm gonna try to share it so you can see the. And I yeah. think that speaks very, um, I think, think that speaks very cogently to the fact that this archival work is not just about what this material or like getting the best quality of these individual tapes. It's about, you know, per people's personal viewing habits, especially in the context of VHS. And I mean, any of us who are old enough, you know, spent plenty of times making VHS compilations. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, as, as Kate is saying, like, it's not just about the fact that there's this wrestling video or there's this porn video, but the fact that, you know, gay male sexuality in this instance is, you know, a transition between the two. It's this like larger uh, ecosystem of desire. Um, but I think like that's such a, a, a great example of what we were talking about earlier. Sorry, I was trying to show you the moments in the film where it break, where it, or in the video where it break, breaks from wrestling to porn and then back. Um, in the Pronger collection, we also have this like Japanese, whatever the Japanese version of WWF or WWE is. And I started digitizing it and I was like, oh, this is cool. Like it's all these like Japanese wrestlers with mullets and like tie dye and like, when are they gonna get naked and have sex? And then like, you know, half an hour later, I'm like, oh, it's just this sort of Japanese pro wrestling homoerotic video in the midst of all of this more like standard explicit porn. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, Desiree, yeah, tell us more about dyke porn um, companies. So in uh, like Fatal Video, in their catalogs, and Tigris also did this too, they would sell, you know, the hardcore that they were making, um, which there was a lot of, but in order to sort of pad their offerings, they would also sell videos of like lesbian wrestling, um, lesbian like Summer Olympics, things like that. So really similar in terms of the juxtaposition. Yeah. There's also a video I was, um, digitizing last week or two weeks ago that was um, one of those like six or seven hour videos. And um, like, I was so over that shift. I was ready for that tape to be finished. And at the end there was sort of like, um, I realized it was a satellite feed. And at the end of, at the end of the, the main title, like interspersed within the previews of other titles that you could order via satellite. There was this like Hector Macho Camacho boxing, like one of those big like 90s wrestling or uh, boxing matches, just like in the middle of all of the other like erotic things that you could order from the satellite company. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, uh, boxing and wrestling matches in this in any uh porn digitization i guess yeah i'm also fascinated in the number of well i mean this is just sort of a reflection of the 80s and early 90s but how many of them look like they could be workout videos you know so and of course there's a long tradition of sort of um going back to at least beefcake if not further of like right the the sort of athletic the, the sort of porn meets athletic, um, um, uh, I guess, aesthetic genre that is both always mildly pornographic, but also mildly, uh, mildly about really just fitness, right? Um, ostensibly, I should say about fitness. Um, offered boxing compilations. Wow, that's amazing, Peter. Uh, God, I wish we could get our hands on some of those. 
Have you seen them? Can you tell us a little bit about them? I mean, I, I may have seen something, but it, they also, the, the bars in LA that had closed circuit video systems that played adult content regularly also played boxing matches. You would kind of go for a two, you'd go for a double feature. One would be a classic boxing match and then you'd stay for the adult film. And I, in fact, I just discovered yesterday that here where I live in Eugene, Oregon, there was a bar here in town that for about six weeks in the early seventies did that. They'd have a double feature of a boxing match and then an adult film. And then the cops came and shut the whole thing down and it only lasted about a month. Um, you, I think you could still get some of those boxing tapes though, to answer your question. I, I, I think I have, I, I haven't watched them, but I have seen the tapes. Yeah, in the box we're currently digitizing, it, no boxing in this collection, but we have about 16 tapes that are of uh, Japanese sexy wrestling, JSW is I believe the company, and it's a long series of wrestling comp compilations, uh, an eight part series, as well as um, a lot of, in the finding aid, it's actually called redacted wrestling, but the on the VHS tapes, it's teen wrestling. Uh, and it appears to be authentic, some of it authentic footage of teen wrestling matches, not staged. Yeah, and David is mentioning um, one of the Rolling Stones apparently used to order girly wrestling compilation tapes from something weird video. <laughs> um, oh, Darshana, do you wanna chime in with your comment? And then Elena? I'm trying to get people to, I don't want you to just have to hear me and see me the whole time. <laughs> so in a lot of VHS tapes, which were circulating in the Middle East, uh, they were circulated as mythological films, uh, but then they had like hardcore porn, which is coming in between. So you'll have to actually wait for it. This is kind of similar to the way the films had, uh, you know, bits, they were called sexually explicit bits added to it. So it, it was in many ways replicating the film exhibition process of having, you know, the explicit bit bit interspersed into the you know VHS tape. So people are expecting that you know there will be a kind of a disruption of their experience which is going to come and they will await for it. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, Elena, do you want to expand on this amazing comment in the chat? Oh, I think you're on mute. Are you? You might be. Yeah, Elena's muted now or was muted. Let's see. Well, I'll read. Do you, can you say something, Elena, not muted and see if we hear you? Oh, you can't hear us. We can't hear you. Um, I think it's probably an, like a microphone input issue because you're not muted okay. in Zoom. Oh, right. That's what I was trying to figure out is. Um, yeah, I mean, I, this, this is great. There's an interesting toggle of VHS between live time and viewing time and archiving time. Wait, can you uh, hear me now? Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, okay. I, I thought I was doing this, you know, this, this gear, this, this like all this <laughs> teaching gear I have now. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's like super interesting. I don't know, just thinking about the unit of duration or just the way that, yeah, the archiving of the work and like just highlights the the sense in which like VHS then becomes this kind of register of like a live time of like taping and accumulating the material. But I guess there's this interesting question of like that disjunct between how we kind of experience a kind of like a digital porn, um, which um, I guess Maggie was talking about. Um, yeah. And so totally. to me, that's like a really fascinating question about, yeah, like how, you know, there's something about like the process of taking care and maintaining this archive is so much about like kind of tending to the duration of these works in a way that, um, yeah, or kind of like there's something that isn't disclosed about the work that the metadata might reveal or that a description of the of the films after they've been cataloged might reveal, but there's something 
about the lived experience of the archivist in the process of in the process of transferring it, even if a lot of that time is also like watching the upload or watching. I've become very attuned to this like process of like recording things and uploading them, which obviously we're all doing with online teaching, but there's like something about like what is the status of that time that we're both like spending with these media that isn't, you know, ab about its kind of functionality in another way. Um, to me, yeah. it's like super fascinating. Yeah, I'm, I totally agree. I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated too by the way the time it takes to care has to be experienced to some extent in the same way you would have experienced in, in taking pleasure from, right? The text or from, from the video in, in, you know, in a time when media, you know, in many ways felt slower, when porn felt slower, when it wasn't driven by these clip formats that are online now. And when you couldn't just jump to the area, to the part of the scene that you wanted to see. And so, yeah, there's something almost, um, there's something almost uh, about that duration that demands an errato historiographic experience, right? Yeah, I think that's a great point. The thing I mean, that it would Patrick. be interesting to be just like to write about that as like, oh. or to kind of think about that, like, how one might theorize that, yeah. Yeah. From the perspective of the arc, you know, the archivist or the person that's, yeah, or just to have, because we, we often think about it in relationship to going to the archive and watching things in this intensive way in the archive, but this is a very different sense of that time that's mediated by the digital, but by, by, mm -hmm. by digitization and by the specificity of VHS. And I think that's like a really interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Kind of like yeah. um, I think, you know, just to go back to this idea of metadata and um, thank you for bringing up this sort of idea of the labor of digitizing. It's sort of, I think there are so many issues here that make this sort of the most fascinating um, topic for, for archiving. But, you know, it's, there's this idea that um, you can, you can get metadata about a movie, its topic, its genre, the fact that it has cityscapes in it, the fact that it's bareback, the fact that it, you know, that there's, um, you know, shaved bodies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, and it would be easy for people doing a critique of, of, of the intake and the acquisition and the digitization process of, you know, things should be done um, X, Y, Z way, but, you know, it's sort of the fact of the matter is, you know, you have, when you have hundreds of VHS tapes, a lot of them are six, seven, eight hours. Um, you know, it would be great if Maggie could, and I could, and anyone else doing this work could sit with these materials and give them the attention that they deserve. Um, just to note, you know, sort of instances of cityscape or instances of, you know, all of these topics that are essential to porn studies and archival studies. But there are, there are realities of this labor that, that mean that it is an imperfect process. And also this sort of, if we acquire hundreds of VHS tapes, right? Someone has to, as Maggie showed at the beginning, someone has to create these spreadsheets at the beginning. Someone has to actually take them from the boxes and put them into archival boxes. Someone has to type out the titles and that might involve an initial scan through of the tape if it's not on the label. There are all of these like complicated things involved in magnetic media archiving. And one of the, I think one of the more valuable things that comes from working with Patrick as he's has sort of this like, this queer, um, just get it done and we'll figure it out um, um, uh, ethic that is really valuable because, you know, you could really just spin in circles on how do we best do this? What is the most ethical way to get these hundreds of hours of, of, of uh, underappreciated by the larger academy? Um, there are like best practices, but you know, this stuff is disappearing. It's decades old. You know, some of these playthroughs are going to be the last playthroughs that these tapes have, and um, I think that's that's maybe 
Patrick, I don't want to speak for you, but it's also, I think that speaks to this idea of like, let's get this stuff digitized. And once we have like a, a bigger view, a macro view of the collection, we can sort of take lessons of what metadata is important, what, um, what are the essential parts of this process? But you know, it, it's been it's been interesting to have just dozens of hours with this with this um, contract of of just trying to figure out if I'm doing things right, if I'm like recording or like I'm paying attention to the right things. And at the end of the day, you know, we're doing what we can, and I think you know that's reflective of the archival world in general. We're just doing what we can to 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 preserve this as best as we can. I don't know if Maggie, if you want to add anything yeah, to that. I, I think that's a great point. And that is such a haunting idea, the, the idea, you know, Patrick talking about so many of the men being depicted in these uh, tapes are are deceased. Like this is a, like a eulogy. Watching the final, the tape for the final run too makes it that much more um, poignant. But just to, in terms of practical considerations, uh, you have RAs on these contracts and you know, I'm, I often, I prefer long shifts. So I'll come in for only a couple of shifts a week, but I will have long sits with these tapes. And I think something, uh, at least with my experience in the tapes is that it's so much about establishing a rhythm. Um, you develop a familiarity with the, the container of the form of these uh, scenes. And so each uh, scene will start playing and I am so attuned at the beginning to the layout of the the performers, uh, the audio, what kind of you know music they introduce it with, the uh, placement of the uh, you know the location that it's taking place in, you clock that, and then for practical purposes, uh, like it, it sort of fades into the background. It also becomes something that's very soothing and rhythmic, and you get used to uh, getting the sense of when the when the scene is going to wrap, like before it does. Uh, it becomes this almost instinctual um, caught in your peripheral vision moment where you think like, we are reaching the pinnacle of this. I, I'm going to cease recording, I must now. Um, and just also, you know, in the chat, uh, Patrick and Farron are pointing out, having to talk <laughs> the administration into how essential this ongoing archiving is. Uh, and also our other work carrying on and the entire university, you know, we're internet university now, everything being digital. It also means that there are, uh, there's this temporal collapse of the different things that we have to be doing in this space at any given time. So of course, it's very unusual for me actually to be in this room and have my, uh, my camera pointing at this screen intentionally because I am so used to the opposite. Interactions that I have on my laptop when I'm in this room almost always have to uh, have just this bland backdrop. And I have to be very conscious to never uh, un uh, unintentionally show anyone hardcore pornography when they're not prepared for it during my daily interactions. Great, thanks. I know we're at time. And so I don't want to keep people longer than, this was only a 90 minute event and I don't want to keep people longer than we promised. I know everyone has lives to get to, um, but I want to thank everyone for coming. This was fantastic. And especially to Maggie and Farron and Kate for joining us and for everyone's comments. I know there's a lot to think about here. This was obviously just a sort of fast and dirty overview. Um, we could probably talk forever about a lot of the um, issues in digitization of porn generally and VHS in particular, but um, yeah, I'm really, um, uh, oh, thanks, Kate. <laughs> she sent me a direct message saying she liked my sweater. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I just wanna thank you all for your comments and I'd love to keep talking about this. If anybody's interested, let me know. I, and Peter, I know you and I have talked about how we want to collaborate in future on things having to do with this, and one day we'll return to that. I know the pandemic has completely, like, you know, thrown us all off track, so, um, and we'll probably be on a different track afterwards. Uh, but um, thank you again for coming, and um, thanks to Lynn and Desiree for your support. Um, so. Bye everyone. Thank you. I have recorded the talk, so I'll pass it yeah. on to the desert. Yeah, and yeah, if somebody wants the recorded version of the talk, just contact me. I'll put it on my OneDrive. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks everyone. <laughs>